Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. This issue we interpret for you is a profound literary work titled Out of Africa. In 1913, a Danish female writer arrived in Kenya, Africa, from Northern Europe to manage a coffee plantation, and she stayed there until 1931. Her many years in Africa made her deeply familiar with the local customs and culture. Upon returning to her homeland, she wrote Out of Africa. American writer Ernest Hemingway once praised it as one of the finest books about Africa he had read. This female writer was Karen Blixen, who used the pen name Isaac Dinesen, which might sound masculine but was her chosen alias. In Denmark, Dinesen was regarded as a literary treasure, on par with Hans Christian Andersen. She was twice nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1954 and 1957 but unfortunately lost to Hemingway and French writer Albert Camus, respectively. It was not that Dinesen's competitors were more renowned. Rather, the Nobel Prize Committee aimed to maintain geographical balance. In the first half of the 20th century, one could almost call the Nobel Prize in Literature half a Nordic literature prize without exaggeration. By 1955, the combined winners from Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Iceland, and Finland amounted to more than a dozen, while literary powerhouses like Britain and the United States had just over ten laureates. Although the works of those Nordic laureates have largely been forgotten, Denison's Out of Africa has seen numerous editions and remains enduring. The book was also adapted into a film of the same name, winning seven Oscars in 1986. Denison's native language was Danish but she wrote out of Africa in English primarily for easier publication. When she first arrived in Africa, her English proficiency was limited, and communicating with the local white settlers was challenging. However, she adapted her writing style to be simple and restrained, making the most of her strengths while concealing her weaknesses. Over time, she improved her English writing and developed a straightforward and robust literary style. Out of Africa is Denison's personal memoir. Later, when she wrote short stories and novellas, she often drew upon characters and events from this book, expanding and elaborating on them. Denison once jokingly said about this practice, Truth belongs to the tailor and shoemaker. Every great artist has to mix a little of the lion with it. Although Out of Africa is a memoir, Denison did not present a mere factual account of her African life. Instead, she saw the book as a lyrical and pastoral literary work, before Denison, female writers, represented by England's Jane Austen, mostly focused on earth-shattering trifles in their works, examining realist themes from a female perspective and conveying life's philosophies. However, in Out of Africa, Denison wrote about gazing at the stars on the grassy plains at night, listening to lions roar under moonlight, the African crescent on a giraffe's back, and the sweat-drenched faces of coffee pickers. This brought a refreshing exotic flavor to the European literary scene, refreshing readers' reading experience. Let's first understand the structure and content of this work. Out of Africa lacks a clear narrative structure and does not follow a specific chronological order. The book can feel somewhat disordered, as if reading an unedited manuscript. In fact, this is related to Denison's literary view. She believed that while authors could determine the content of the narrative, they could not control the outcome, and thus, they could not completely manipulate the structure of the text. In this book, Denison did not use the common technique of freely shifting between the perspectives of each character, as used by realist writers of the 18th and 19th centuries. She consistently observed the African world through her own eyes. When describing life in Africa, she did not impose excessive subjective commentary but rather maintained a relatively indirect and objective approach. Some white authors, such as British writer Rudyard Kipling, often revealed a condescending and derogatory tone when writing about people of color. However, Denison's narrative conveyed her empathy for the African people. The book consists of five parts. The first two parts primarily depict Denison's initial experiences in Africa and her interactions with the local people as well as her observations of them. The remaining three parts focus on the lives of white settlers in Africa, the management of the farm, Denison's relationships with a few white friends, and how she eventually left Africa. The first part is titled Kamanti and Lulu. Kamanti is a young African native boy, 
and Lulu is a young gazelle. Denison's Coffee Plantation is located in the outskirts of Nairobi, Kenya's capital. To alleviate the loneliness and monotony of farm life and to bond with the local natives, Denison often acted as a doctor, treating the indigenous people like an itinerant healer. Her medical skills were quite limited, merely based on some basic knowledge acquired from a first aid course. However, due to successfully curing a few cases, she gained a considerable reputation among the local people. When Denison first saw Kamanti, the young boy's legs were covered with ulcers, from his thighs down to his feet. Without treatment, he wouldn't have lived more than a few weeks. Despite this, Kamanti's face showed no fear, only a sense of acceptance. This deeply impressed Denison, who remarked in her book, Most white men will strive to avoid the attacks of an unknown world and destiny, while black men have always been in the hands of fate, and in a sense, fate is their home, the darkness they are accustomed to in their huts, and they remain unruffled by any changes in life. Later, Camanti cooperated actively during his treatment, displaying the strength of a warrior during the cleaning and dressing of his wounds. His demeanor reminded Denison of a famous quote attributed to the Greek mythological figure Prometheus, Pain is my portion, turn me up, I don't mind. Once Camanti recovered from his injuries, he came to live with Denison and served her as a servant for over a decade until she eventually returned to her homeland. Denison sent Camanti to a high-class club in Nairobi to study cooking. Camanti showed great talent, and Denison's table became famous in Nairobi's white social circles. As a chef, Camanti's shining moment came when he prepared a meal for the Prince of Wales, Edward VIII, during his visit to the farm. The prince highly praised Camanti's culinary skills. Lulu was an exceptionally beautiful young gazelle. One day, while driving from the farm to Nairobi, a group of young boys approached Denison, offering to sell her the gazelle. She bought the gazelle and named her Lulu, which means pearl in the Swahili language commonly used in Africa. Lulu quickly gained the affection and love of everyone on the farm. She particularly loved Camanti and was inseparable from him, leading Denison to jest that they were the latest version of Beauty and the Beast. Under Denison's pen, Lulu stood elegant and round, with a nose as black and shiny as a truffle. As Lulu grew up, she lived with a vigorous male gazelle in the forest near the farm, wearing a bell that Denison had attached to her neck. Eventually, Denison rarely saw Lulu, but one of her most unforgettable memories of Africa was lying in bed at dawn, hearing the crisp sound of the bell coming from the nearby forest, indicating that Lulu had come visiting. The second part is titled The Shooting Incident, which describes an accidental incident that occurred on the farm. Through this event, Denison gained a close observation of the local people's notions of justice and punishment. One evening, Denison stood in front of her house when she heard a gunshot not far away. It was unusual for anyone to hunt at night. If it were to scare away wild animals, they would usually fire two or three shots. Denison waited for a second shot but there was none. Soon, the farm's white steward arrived on his motorcycle, telling her that a seven-year-old kitchen boy had stolen the steward's gun to show off in front of his friends on his birthday. Unfortunately, the gun went off, resulting in the death of one child and injuring another. Frightened, the boy dropped the gun and fled into the dark forest. The next day, some elderly African men on the farm told Denison that they wanted to hold the Kiamas, a meeting of elders, to discuss the shooting incident and compensation matters. This type of meeting had government authorization and generally dealt with internal disputes, criminal cases, or accidents among the indigenous people. The elders who attended the meeting would sit together for several weeks, eating lamb and discussing matters. Denison discovered that Europeans and Africans had very different understandings of the concept of justice. In the eyes of Africans, the only solution to disasters in life was compensation. They would not investigate the motives behind specific actions. Whether it was cutting an enemy's throat in the dark, deliberate murder, or accidentally killing someone while chopping a tree, to Africans, it was all the same compensation was required. They did not use reason to weigh the relationship between guilt and punishment, but instead brainstormed to determine how many sheep and goats would serve as compensation. Most tribes in Africa followed this pattern, only replacing sheep and goats with camels or horses among different tribes. 
The local elders frequently invited Dennison to attend these meetings, playing a role similar to a juror, and this shooting incident was no exception. However, Dennison was greatly disheartened by these meetings because their sole purpose was to mercilessly fleece and divide the property of the culprits. This time, she argued logically, pointing out to the elders that the culprit was just a seven-year-old child, and this was an accidental injury, not intentional murder. The culprit's family was also a victim as they lost their son. But the elders paid no attention to Dennison's defense. They politely listened and insisted on demanding compensation of forty sheep from the culprit's father. Unable to bear the thought of bankrupting the culprit's family with economic punishment, Dennison invited tribal chiefs and a British police officer from Nairobi to act as mediators, eventually reducing the punishment to one cow and its calf. The third part of this book, Farm Visitors, and the fourth part, Immigrants Note, mainly depict the white settlers in colonial Kenya. Dennison's farm was a favorite place for local white people, where they could enjoy books, linen beddings, and the cool atmosphere inside the rooms with their blinds pulled down. There was a man among the farm visitors who was quite exceptional, named Dennis Finch Hatton. What made him special was that he didn't belong to any of the usual categories of white people in Africa at that time, missionaries, colonial pioneers, or those who were dissatisfied with life in their own countries. Dennis came from a typical British aristocratic family. His father was an earl, and he himself graduated from Oxford University. He was handsome, humorous, and had a gentle wit, qualities that would have allowed him to prosper back in England without enduring any hardships in Africa. When he initially moved to Africa, his friends back in England were rather regretful. However, in the colony, Dennis quickly became a heartthrob, adored and admired by both white and black people. The white settlers loved him for his athleticism, musical talents, artistic interests, and exceptional skills as an explorer. Among the African locals, Dennis had a unique magnetism. He understood and sympathized with them. He did not support the European colonization and missionary activities in Africa. While Dennison established a local school for the native children on her farm, Dennis didn't see it as a significant endeavor. He once said, If we keep shining the light of enlightenment and reason on the Africans for a long time, one day they will go blind and yearn even more for darkness. Despite being a heartthrob, Dennis felt like an outcast at heart, not belonging to the society or any place in the world but a different time. He didn't fit into his own era, even though he excelled in it. Dennis viewed Kenya as a utopian dreamland, where various groups of people, such as native black Africans, European missionaries, Indian merchants, Arab sailors, Somali pastoralists, and others, could live together harmoniously. The slow pace of life the transition between dry and rainy seasons, and the abundance of wildlife in Kenya captivated him. Dennis's profession in Africa was that of a hunter, making a living through hunting. By the early 20th century, hunting in East Africa had become commercialized. European and American aristocrats and wealthy businessmen would often spend a fortune on hunting in Africa, particularly targeting large animals like elephants, zebras, giraffes, lions, and hippos. This extravagant form of hunting was known as big game hunting. Dennis once accompanied the son of U.S. President Roosevelt on a hunting expedition. This luxurious hunting trip lasted for six months, with a Dodge sedan, two Chevrolet trucks, 100 porters, three tents, two for sleeping and one as a dining hall, and numerous personal servants responsible for cooking and carrying guns. In addition to his exceptional hunting skills, Dennis Finch Hatton possessed a deep literary knowledge. When he immigrated to Africa, he brought two things with him, Bordeaux vintage red wine from France and a large collection of rare books, including Voltaire's work Philosophical Dictionary. When visiting the farm, Dennis could engage in discussions with Dennison about Homer and Shakespeare. He even referred to Dennison as Titania, the fairy queen in Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. Dennison considered herself a talented storyteller. When spending time with Dennis, she would tell him stories she had crafted herself, and he would comfortably sit by the fireplace, listening. Dennison sat cross-legged on the floor, much like Scheherazade from One Thousand and One Nights, who kept telling stories to the king to avoid being killed. 
In Dennison's case, she shared stories to captivate Dennis's heart, and their love naturally blossomed on the African savanna. Let me introduce Dennison's previous romantic life. She had a husband named Breer, and their marriage was far from happy. Breer was passionate about hunting and often disappeared for months, neglecting the coffee plantation on the farm. What troubled Dennison the most was Breer's infidelity. Eventually, they had to divorce. After the divorce, Dennison had Breer move away from the farm, and she took charge of all affairs. Returning to Dennis, in pursuit of freedom in travel, he learned to fly planes, which was an entirely novel concept at the time. One day, he invited Dennison to travel with him in his small plane. Dennison showed complete trust and boarded the aircraft without hesitation. Through the flight, Dennis offered Dennison a godlike perspective, allowing her to overlook the immensely familiar African landscape. Sitting in the plane, Dennison felt her heart and mind open up, and everything became insignificant. She was overwhelmed with excitement and developed a sense of hero worship towards Dennis. However, happy times are always short-lived. The fifth part of the book, Farewell to the Farm, describes how Dennison's life in Africa eventually succumbed to a sense of loss. Three severe droughts led to a sharp decline in the farm's coffee production. Following that, the attempt to grow flax failed due to a lack of skilled African laborers. Managing the farm became an increasingly heavy burden for Dennison. Furthermore, she suffered emotional blows as several of her close white friends passed away. The world around her in Africa suddenly became quiet. As Dennison and Dennis spent more time together, their relationship also experienced conflicts. Dennison wanted to establish a family with Dennis, but his attitude was initially ambiguous. In 1931, when Dennis accompanied the Prince of Wales, Edward VIII, on a hunting trip, he invited Dennison's ex-husband, Breer, but did not include Dennison, which left her feeling humiliated. Dennison temporarily cut ties with Dennis and refused to respond to his letters. However, Dennis had already become emotionally dependent on Dennison and surrendered himself to her. Just as Dennison's life in Africa was about to take a turn, Dennis was involved in a plane crash during a flight and tragically perished on the coast. This became the final straw that broke Dennison, marking a fateful end to her life in Africa. Now that we have learned about the main content, let's talk about the differences between the book Out of Africa and its film adaptation. Speaking of Out of Africa, the film adaptation is a topic that cannot be ignored. It is safe to say that far more people have watched the movie than read the original book. However, literature and film are two completely different art forms. Movies, fundamentally, are one-way entertainment. In the time when people could not watch movies at home, no matter how exquisite and grand the movie's visuals and camera work were, for cinema audiences, the film was merely a one-time aesthetic experience. It could not be revisited repeatedly like a literary work, engaging in a soulful interaction with the author. In the world of film screenwriting, there is a saying that the lesser known the literary original work, the easier it is to adapt into a movie because the adaptation is less constrained by the source material, allowing the screenwriter more creative freedom. Conversely, if the original work has a massive reputation, the pressure on the screenwriter is greater. Of course, there are cases of strong competition as well. For example, in the earliest film adaptation of Pride and Prejudice, the screenwriter was the renowned Aldous Huxley, the author of Brave New World. He did not hold back and basically rewrote Pride and Prejudice into another novel, not paying much attention to the original by Jane Austen. Nevertheless, the final result was good, and the film retained a strong literary ambience. However, due to the lack of outdoor scenes, it resembled a stage play to some extent. The original book out of Africa mainly excels in its characters, atmosphere, and narrative techniques, but lacks a strong plot and intricate storyline. To adapt it into a successful Hollywood blockbuster, additional elements must be incorporated. As mentioned earlier, the film adaptation of Out of Africa won seven Academy Awards. The film's success lies in the smart use of two key elements from the original work, love and scenery. Combined with tear-jerking music and breathtaking aerial shots, the film portrays the romantic history of Dennison and Dennis against the magnificent 
an awe-inspiring backdrop of the African continent, making love the central theme of the movie. If Denison, who has since passed away, could know about this film adaptation, one can only wonder what her thoughts would be. On the other hand, if the original work were written based on the content of this movie, it would simply be a sentimental love story. The French writer Marguerite Duras once said, If a woman's writing does not start from desire, then it is not writing. However, Denison, the protagonist, is not such a writer. Instead, she is a strong-willed literary lianus. In this book, readers can hardly find direct descriptions of the profound love between her and Dennis. She mainly expresses her love for him through the praises and acknowledgments of others. While the movie vividly portrays the love between the main characters, it fails to depict the deep anguish buried beneath their love. Avoiding or downplaying this anguish compresses the film's depth of thought and diminishes the tragic depth of the characters. Whether in the original work or the film adaptation, one proposition has been overlooked by many. Since Denison lived in the beautiful Africa, why did she ultimately choose to leave and never return? On the surface, the movie and the original work maintain a high degree of consistency in the plot. The film continues with the description of the final part of the original work, using visuals and plot to depict the floods and fires that the coffee plantation went through. It also vividly portrays Dennis's funeral. As a result, viewers naturally assume that the bankruptcy of the plantation and the loss of her soulmate are what ultimately led Dennison to decide to return to Europe. However, if one reads Dennison's biography and related historical materials, they will discover that long before Dennis's plane crash, Dennison had already prepared to return to Europe. Even if the coffee plantation went bankrupt, compared to the white farmers, Dennison's financial situation was still quite favorable, and she was not compelled to return to Europe due to destitution. Furthermore, in the first half of the original book, Dennison hardly discusses any financial urgency and readers cannot sense any economic pressure on her. This is because the farm Dennison manages is not a small venture but a wealthy family-owned joint stock company. Dennison's mother's family were Danish merchants who invested in rubber in Malaysia and tea in Ceylon, Sri Lanka. Dennison's family purchased a large piece of land in the outskirts of Nairobi from the British colonial government, which included over 30,000 acres of arable land and over 10,000 acres of pasture employing over 1,200 local native laborers. Therefore, even in the event of bankruptcy, Dennison could still lead a considerably privileged life in Africa. So why did Dennison decide to return to Europe? The real answer is that Dennison, in terms of her thoughts and temperament, belongs to the pre-Second Industrial Revolution aristocracy. The Second Industrial Revolution refers to the industrial advancements that took place between 1870 and 1914, including rapid industrialization in Western European countries, including Denmark, Denison's homeland. When Denison came to Africa in 1913, in a sense, it was a pursuit of self-exile, distancing herself from the smoke and pollution of the European continent, seeking to become a proletarian and an outcast of the industrial age. Therefore, in this book, Denison writes, true aristocrats and true proletarians are alike. For them, tragedy is the basic principle of God, the secret of existence. They are different from the middle-class white immigrants who refuse tragedy and cannot endure it. Denison's disappointment with industrial civilization was influenced by her father. Her father was a former military officer who had gone on hunting trips to North America and had a good relationship with the local Native Americans. During her childhood, her father told Denison, the Indians are better than us Europeans. They see more with their eyes, and they are wiser than us. These words planted a seed in Denison's heart and laid the groundwork for her later life in Africa. However, after World War I, Africa was no longer a natural paradise. Colonization, wars, deforestation, and overhunting of wildlife disrupted the ancient rhythms of this continent. In the book, Denison regretfully expresses, after the steam engine was invented, nations of the world went their separate ways, and we have never seen each other again. In the industrial era, white people can no longer understand and sympathize with people of color. So, on the surface, Denison is recording the Africa she once knew in this book, but in reality, 
she is mourning the world that can never return to its past state. The bankruptcy of the coffee plantation represents not only the loss of her little paradise, but also a microcosm of the disappearance of the larger African paradise. From her teenage years, Denison wanted her life to be like a drama. Her later life was indeed worthy of an epic drama, but unfortunately, the script was not written by herself but by fate. In the book Out of Africa, whether it's the fate of the black people or the white people, Denison's touch remains calm. In her view, both white and black people are puppets of fate, experiencing prosperity and misfortune at different times. Denison, through her simple and unadorned writing style, tells the world that contemplation on human destiny and the meaning of existence doesn't necessarily have to unfold on a grand scale like Tolstoy's War and Peace. Through the reflection of feminine care and universal love, even ordinary and tranquil narrations can achieve a profound exploration of life's questions. Now, we have covered the essential content of Out of Africa. Finally, let's review the key points from this article. First, Isaac Dinesen is a literary treasure of Denmark and has been nominated twice as a candidate for the Nobel Prize in Literature. Her language is simple, restrained, and her writing style is plain and firm. Out of Africa is her personal memoir, and this pastoral literary work brought a refreshing breath to the European literary scene at that time. Second, Out of Africa mainly narrates Dinesen's initial interactions with the local black people upon her arrival in Africa her observations of them, the lives of the white colonizers in Africa, the management of the farm, Denison's relationships with several white friends, and finally, her departure from Africa. Throughout the book, Denison uses her own perspective to observe the African world, and her narrative allows readers to empathize with the local African people. Third, the real reason why Denison ultimately chose to leave Africa and return to Europe was not due to the bankruptcy of the farm or losing her soulmate. She came to Africa with the intention of becoming a proletarian and an outcast of the industrial age, but post-World War I Africa was no longer a natural paradise. On the surface, Denison's Out of Africa records her experience in Africa, but in reality, she mourns for a world that can never return to its past state. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.